A long time ago, in a continent far, far away, my wife and I lived in France. That was before we had children, and because we were footloose and fancy free, sometimes when we had a few days off, we would throw a, a bag over our shoulders and take whatever disposable income we had, and we would be off to discover a part of Europe that we didn't know about. I could tell you lots of stories that would be interesting to me, perhaps not to you, uh, but I'll just share one briefly with you. One time we uh, backpacked around some of the historic sites of Greece, uh, around central Greece and the Peloponnese, and then we went island hopping for a few days on the Cyclades Islands. We were on our way to Santorini, which is one of the most interesting, probably the most interesting of the Greek islands. It's uh, an island that many experts believe was the origin of the legend of Atlantis, the lost continent, because it was a volcano basically that blew up at some point about 3000 BC. But on our way there, we accidentally ended up spending the night on the Isle of Paros. We hadn't intended to, it just happened that way. That was part of the a path we had to go in order to get uh, to Santorini. It's a beautiful island, as are most of the Greek islands, whitewashed houses with blue roofs, little pedestrian streets, wonderful restaurants with wonderful food, not expensive. Uh, at the time, at least, it was inexpensive and tranquil. I've not been back since that time, and that's a ways now. But I learned that the main claim to fame of the island of Paros was that in 712 BC, a famous Greek poet named Archilochus was born there. Archilochus is remembered for a number of different things. He's remembered as being the creator of iambic verse. That probably doesn't mean too much to you unless you're an English teacher. Uh, you had to learn about iambic pentameter if you read any Shakespeare in high school. Uh, Archilochus probably created a couple of other literary forms as well, but today, He's most famous for having created an aphorism that is still quoted widely down to our time. He said, the fox knows many things, but the hedgehog knows one big thing. And I would like for us to reflect on that for a few minutes today. This phrase is still quoted widely and in many different contexts. Uh, there was a management book, a best-selling management book that came out a few years ago called Good to Great. And it featured a whole chapter on this aphorism. The fox knows many things, but the hedgehog knows one big thing. And I'd like to read just a brief excerpt from uh, what appeared in this book, Good to Great, because it explains the meaning behind uh, this saying. Basically, it comes down to the fact that the hedgehog needs only one principle that directs his life. The fox is a pluralist. He travels many paths, many roads, has many different ideas, sometimes ideas that conflict with each other. Um, and so let me read this quote now from the book. The fox is a cunning creature, able to devise a myriad of complex strategies for sneak attacks upon the hedgehog. Day in and day out, the fox circles around the hedgehog's den, waiting for the perfect moment to pounce. Fast, sleek, beautiful, fleet of foot, and crafty, the fox looks like the sure winner. The hedgehog, on the other hand, is a dowdier creature, looking like a genetic mix-up between a porcupine and a small armadillo. He waddles along, going about his simple day, searching for lunch and taking care of his home. The fox waits in cunning silence at the juncture in the trail. The hedgehog, minding his own business, wanders right into the path of the fox. Ah, I have you now, thinks the fox. He leaps out, bounding across the ground, lightning fast. The little hedgehog, sensing danger, looks up and thinks, here we go again. Will he ever learn? Rolling up into a perfect little ball, the hedgehog becomes a sphere of sharp spikes pointing out in all directions. The fox, bounding toward his prey, sees the hedgehog defense and calls off the attack. Retreating back into the forest, he begins to calculate a new line of attack. Each day, some version of this battle between the hedgehog and the fox takes place, and despite the greater cunning of the fox, the hedgehog always wins. And in good to great, they make a, uh, they, uh, make a business application to this, that businesses should do what they're best at and concentrate on one big thing. But applications of this aphorism are not limited to business, uh, business applications. Um, MBAs are studying it, CEOs are studying it, but so are literary critics. Uh, I read a uh, an essay by Isaiah Berlin, who was a brilliant 20th century thinker and literary critic. He wrote a, a criticism of Leon Tolstoy, and he labeled it, 
the hedgehog and the fox. And in his critique, he posits that all human beings can be categorized as either one or the other. You're either a hedgehog or you're a fox. And he was applying this to literary people, but he believed that this could be applied to everything. Let me read you a short excerpt of his critique. Here are the first lines of that essay. There is a line among the fragments of the Greek poet Archilochus which says, the fox knows many things, but the hedgehog knows one big thing. Scholars have differed about the correct interpretation of these dark words, which may mean no more than that the fox, for all his cunning, is defeated by the hedgehog's one defense. But taken figuratively, the words can be, mailed to, can be made to yield a sense in which they mark one of the deepest differences that divide writers and thinkers, and it may be human beings in general. For there exists a great chasm between those who on one side who relate everything to a single central vision, one system more or less coherent or articulate, in terms of which they understand, think, and feel, a single universal organizing principle in terms of which alone all that they are and say has significance. And on the other side, those who pursue many ends, often unrelated and even contradictory, connected, if at all, only in some de facto way for some physiological or psychological cause, related by no moral or aesthetic principle. These last lead lives, perform acts, and entertain ideas that are centrifugal rather than centripetal. Their thought is scattered or diffused, moving on many levels, seizing upon the essence of a vast variety of experiences and objects for which they are in themselves without, consciously or unconsciously, seeking to fit them into or exclude them from any one unchanging, all-embracing, unitary vision. I hope you followed all of that. Uh, it's a rather interesting thought to contemplate. Isaiah Berlin applied this to writers, and he would say some of them are hedgehogs in their literary format, and some of them are foxes. They go after all sorts of different things. And if you want to know what his opinion of Tolstoy was, he believed Tolstoy was a fox who wanted to be a hedgehog, but never successfully made it. Now, there's probably a burning question in your mind right now. What in the world does this have to do with me? Well, I think it does have something to do with you. I think it has something to do with all of us. And that's why I propose today, brethren, that we take a moment and we think about foxes and hedgehogs. Because I'm going to propose to you that in spiritual matters, which are the most important in our lives, we must be hedgehogs. We must concentrate on one big thing. The world knows many things. The world is pulled in many directions and it loses itself in many different things, in many different arenas of life. But Christians are not to be that way. Turn with me, if you would, to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. We'll read verses 15 and 16. 1 John First epistle of John, chapter 2, starting in verse 15. John writes here, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lusts of the flesh, the lusts of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And John sort of sums up the motivation that most people have as they go through their lives, deciding what to pursue or what to leave aside. He sums it all up in three broad categories. The lusts of the flesh, everything that's materialistic, egocentric, exploitive. The lust of the eyes, what looks beautiful, and the desire human beings innately have to possess those beautiful things, that which attracts our attention. And the pride of life, to appear better, than others, or to be better esteemed than others that we might come in contact with. That all sounds pretty modern, doesn't it? You think of the things, the activities that people pursue today. People will pursue one thing and then they don't carry it all the way through, they kind of lose interest in it and then something else distracts them and they go off in a different direction. And many people go through their whole lives living in such a way. I've got this new game on my phone, look at this new video. My Facebook feed's got something interesting. I can spend minutes or hours on that. 
Look at this cute new singer who's got a great new song. There's this new series on television, a cool Xbox game. It's all fascinating, and it's all pulling us in different directions, each one distracting us from the others. Canadian writer Stephen Leacock wrote of a man who flung himself upon his horse and rode madly off in all directions. And that's the way a lot of people live their lives, too, riding madly off in all directions. And we have so many directions to take today. YouTube, pop culture, movies, music, magazines, everything that's on the internet. What John wrote seems extremely modern to us, and yet he wrote it 2,000 years ago, which shows us that the world never really changes. Human beings don't really change. The human experience and the human existence doesn't really change, and it hasn't changed for thousands of years. People were foxes back then, just as they are today. This is as ancient as mankind. And I would like to point out, just for a moment, if I can open a parenthetical thought here for some of our young people, teens and even younger. For thousands of years, young people have been dazzled by the glitzy details of their own particular generation. And they often think that the world is totally different than it ever has been before. I can remember thinking those thoughts myself when I got to my teenage years. And so when parents tell young people, I remember what that feels like, there's a temptation to, for eye rolling, like you couldn't possibly. <laughs> Coming from way back where you came from, back in ancient times, you can't possibly understand what it's like today. The modern world is totally different from when you were young, you can't possibly understand. Oh, but they can. To them, it doesn't seem like very long ago when they were experiencing the same things that you are experiencing. Because fundamentally, the world doesn't change. The fundamental issues of life don't change. Some unimportant details change, but the fundamental issues do not. So when your parents tell you they understand, they really do understand. In many ways, as I said, it seems like it was just yesterday in their own minds that they were going through many of those same experiences all the things that you feel, the rushing, thrilling emotions of youth, discovering the world like the baby we heard about in the sermonette. Parents may not get all the details, they may not get the fad names, the latest cool appellations for different things. That's really the unimportant stuff. But the really important things they do get, they understand, they've lived through it. Because human life doesn't really change, the human experience doesn't change, only a few unimportant details. So the moral of that story is when your parents tell you things like that, you would do well to listen to them because they really have been through it and they really know. Listen to them. Don't just hear them out. Don't just sit through the lecture. Really listen and take advantage of the experience that they want to share with you. Okay, I'm closing that parentheses. You teens can let out a sigh of relief now. We'll go. We now return you to your regularly scheduled sermon. <laughs> People in the world know many things. In fact, Jesus even said, in some ways, they're shrewder than the children of light, which is what we are supposed to be. Let's look at what he said in John 16. John chapter 16. I'm sorry, Luke 16. Luke chapter 16. Wrote that down wrong. Luke 16, starting in verse 1. He said to his disciples, There was a certain rich man who had a steward, and an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. He had a dishonest servant. So he called him and said to him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account for your stewardship, for you can no longer be steward. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my master is taking the stewardship away from me. I cannot dig. I am ashamed to beg. I have resolved what to do, that when I am put out of stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of his master's debtors to him and said to the first, How much did you owe my master? And he said, A hundred measures of oil. So he said to him, Take your bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. I'm having your debt. Now please remember that when I need a, a hand myself. He said to another, How much do you owe? So he said, A hundred measures of wheat. And he said, Take your bill and write eighty. In verse 8, we see a rather unexpected reaction from the master of the house. 
The master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly. He took advantage of a window of opportunity to feather his own bed, as the old saying goes. And then Jesus said, the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. People in the world who don't live by a Christian moral code know many things. Many of them will know how to lie, cheat, and steal to improve their situation. That's the way of the world. We've come to expect that. We don't expect people always to tell us the truth. We count our change. We go over the accounting to make sure that someone hasn't taken advantage of us. We expect that in the world in which we live. People take advantage of the situation in order not to finish last. And of course, that only lasts for a while. It seems to last, it seems to work, but it only lasts so long because eventually, the Bible says, you reap what you sow. And that is not what God wants us to know. He doesn't want us to be shrewd like the foxes in the world that know many things, and some of them conflicting with each other. Jesus told his disciples to focus on one big thing. One of the places he said that was in Matthew chapter 6. Let's turn there. Matthew chapter 6. Verse 19, Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroys and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In other words, don't become distracted from your spiritual priorities. Don't let other things come and interrupt and get themselves between you, us, and God. Verse 24, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. It's a question of priorities. Then he said in verse 25, therefore I say to you, don't worry about your life, what you'll eat or what you drink, nor about your body, what you'll put on. And that's what most people in the world are worried about. That's what they pursue. That's what they think about constantly. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? And he uses some examples from nature to show that God takes care of his creation. And he'll take care of us as well as long as we focus on that one big thing. And we come to it in verse 33, Matthew 6, 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Christians are to know this one big thing. That's to be their first pursuit. As Isaiah Berlin put it, a single universal organizing principle in terms of which alone all that they are and say has significance. That should be true of us, and that principle, that single universal concept, is the reality of the kingdom of God. That is the central message of the Bible, from the beginning all the way to the end. And that needs to be the organizing principle around which our lives are focused. Luke chapter 10 has a really interesting example from the ministry of Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 10. Start reading in verse 38. Luke chapter 10, verse 38. Jesus was visiting Mary and Martha, who were particular friends, along with their brother Lazarus. Particular friends of his. He spent time with them. They're mentioned a number of times in the Gospels. Verse 38 says, It happened as they went that he entered a certain village And a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his words. But Martha was distracted with much serving. There's nothing wrong with service. In fact, the Bible encourages us to serve. But we can never lose sight of what the priorities are and the one big thing. She approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? 
Therefore, tell her to help me. Now, there are lots of lessons we could draw from this little episode here. Um, Martha was a bit manipulative, telling Christ to tell her sister to do something. Uh, we sometimes meet people like that. But at heart, she was an admirable woman, and one of Jesus' disciples, in fact. And Jesus helped recenter the priorities. In verse 41, Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. Apparently, she was taking the approach of the fox. She knew many things. She was distracted by many things. But then, in verse 42, Jesus said, one thing is needed. There's one priority here in this case. It's the kingdom of God. And Mary is sitting at my feet learning about it. She has her priorities in place. She's seeking that one big thing. She's seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And he concluded by saying, which will not be taken away from her. I'm not going to tell her to leave off what is most important. She's doing the right thing. You're the one, Martha, that needs to shift your priorities and pursue that one thing. This is a common theme in the Bible, in the New Testament in particular. Let's look at a couple of other passages. Let's look at one, at least, in Philippians chapter 3. Philippians 3. Paul says something similar to what Jesus told Martha. Philippians chapter 3, verse 13. This is Paul explaining his priorities in life and how he organized it, the way he viewed his existence and his activity and what his priorities were. He says in verse 13, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. I've not already succeeded. But one thing I do. One thing I do. He had a unitary focus on what he was supposed to be achieving with his life. One thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. What is ahead? The kingdom of God is ahead. And that was the one thing that Paul said he was pursuing. I forget everything else. All those many things I used to know and be concerned about, I forget them. They're behind me. Now I do one thing. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So Paul said, one thing I do. He was pursuing the kingdom of God, seeking it first and God's righteousness. It's interesting, many professing Christians in the world today don't really or fully realize how much the kingdom of God is really the leitmotif that runs through the whole Bible. From beginning to end, the central theme of the Bible is the kingdom of God. Many people don't even know even professing Christians don't even really know what that kingdom is, that it's going to be an actual kingdom installed here on earth with Jesus Christ as the, uh, as the, the ruler, the king. Well, let's look at a couple of examples, and just, just briefly, we'll do just a quick overview, and we'll see some of these references to the kingdom of God all the way from the beginning of the Bible up into the New Testament. First of all, we have one in the third chapter of the Bible, Genesis chapter 3. Let's look there briefly. Genesis 3, after Adam and Eve sinned, they believed the serpent instead of believing God. God actually gave a prophecy here. He told this prophecy to the serpent. And of course, Adam and Eve heard it. The Lord God said to the serpent, Genesis 3, verse 14, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. And probably in your translation of the Bible, the second word seed has a capital S on there, because it's obviously a reference to the Messiah, the Christ who was to come. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. A prophecy about the ultimate triumph of the Messiah over Satan and therefore the establishment of the kingdom of God. We have it in the third chapter of the Bible already. God was already giving prophecies about what was going to happen and the establishment of the kingdom of God. Isaiah chapter 65, 
Isaiah 65, we have another prophecy that borrows the imagery from Genesis 3. Isaiah 65, verse 25. Isaiah 65, verse 25. And this links that prophecy in Genesis 3 with the prophecies in Isaiah about the kingdom of God to come. Verse 25, the wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. That's imagery we recognize well for the world tomorrow, the kingdom of God. And notice the next part, dust shall be the serpent's food. So that reference back in Genesis 3 was a reference to the ultimate triumph of the kingdom of God over Satan. Allowing for the establishment of that kingdom. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. Already in Genesis 3, we have a reference to the kingdom of God. Later in Genesis, Genesis 22, when God was working with Abraham, there were explanations that were given about the kingdom of God. Genesis 22. One of the promises that was given to Abraham is found in verse 18 of Genesis 22. In your seed... All the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. That's a prophecy of the Messiah, once again, who would be a descendant of Abraham. And Jesus was. But eventually the blessing of the Messiah, which isn't touching the whole world yet, but eventually it will when the kingdom of God is established. And all nations will be blessed in that seed. Everyone will have access to God. Turn a few pages to Genesis 26. Genesis 26, verse 4. Another promise, this time given to Isaac. I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give to your descendants all these lands, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. This blessing was passed on from father to son, down through the line of Abraham until eventually it was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. We have a reference in Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 2, rather interesting reference here too, that shows that the knowledge of the kingdom of God was not a hidden thing among the Israelites. They had at least some understanding of what God's plan was and what was going to happen in the future, the establishment of the kingdom of God. This actually comes in a prayer by Samuel's mother, Hannah. She was a devout woman, and she understood at least certain elements of the good news of the coming kingdom of God. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 10. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken in pieces, she prays. From heaven he will thunder against them. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horns of his anointed. His anointed. She understood there was going to be the Lord's anointed, that he was going to judge the whole earth and would put down the enemies of God. Apparently, just a devout woman in Israel it doesn't seem to be a particularly educated one. We have no reference to that. But she understood the fundamentals of the coming kingdom of God, and she prayed about it to God. Psalm 96. Let's look at Psalms 96 also. Another reference to the kingdom of God. Psalm 96, we'll start reading in verse 11. Let the heavens rejoice, let the earth be glad, let the sea roar in all its fullness. Let the field be joyful and all that in it is. Then all the trees of the woods will rejoice coming before the Lord, for he is coming. He is coming to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. David understood the good news of the coming kingdom of God. He talked about it in Psalms. He talked to God about his joy in that. Interestingly, you can find this particular psalm quoted in 1 Chronicles 16 at the time that the Ark of the Covenant was being brought into Jerusalem. 
and this psalm was apparently quoted or sung for the first time at that event. And then it ended up in the book of Psalms here, uh, preserved also in this particular place. But it says that at the end, if you read 1 Chronicles 16, you can compare later, at the end of it, it says all the people were there to witness this great event. They heard this song being sung about the coming kingdom of God. And the last part of 1 Chronicles 16 quotes and says, all the people said amen and praised the Lord. The gospel was preached to the Israelites. They were to understand that there was going to be a coming kingdom of God. We know, of course, there are many prophecies in Isaiah about the establishment of the kingdom of God, that great millennial period, the thousand-year reign of Christ on the earth. Those you just heard read, no doubt, a number of times at the Feast of Tabernacles, a time when we focus on that. But we can move forward in time yet farther to the time of Daniel, the 500s approximately B.C. Let's look at Daniel chapter 2. Daniel 2, verse 44. The kingdom of God was preached to the pagan kings that Daniel served. In the days of these kings, verse 44 of Daniel 2, the God of heaven shall set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. The gospel of the kingdom of God. It is the thread, the light motif that runs all the way through the Bible, the most important theme. God is going to establish a kingdom that will last forever. And of course, when we come down to the time of the New Testament period, also it's not hidden. In fact, Jesus preached. That was his message throughout his whole ministry. And the apostles and the ministers and the members and the church that followed in that first century period, they had it very much to mind. 1 Corinthians 15, let's just take one example. 1 Corinthians 15. First Corinthians 15, verse 24. Paul is explaining what's going to happen in the future. And he says, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom of God to the Father. When he puts an end to all rule and all authority and all power. He must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. All the way from the beginning of the Bible, all the way through to the end. And of course, even in the book of Revelation, the very last book in the Bible, probably the last one written, it's all about the establishment of the kingdom of God. How it's going to happen. What are the... The events that are going to lead up to it. What will it be like when Christ returns at the head of an angelic army to end human resistance? From beginning to end, the Bible talks about the kingdom of God. That is our one big thing. That's the context that must be the framework of our lives. In Luke chapter 14, Jesus warned his disciples not to let themselves get distracted. They needed to remain hedgehogs not allow themselves to become foxes, to use that analogy, distracted by many things, knowing many things, sometimes contradictory things. Luke chapter 14, verse 26. Luke 14, verse 26. He said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and his mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life, he cannot be my disciple. If you're not pursuing that one big thing more than anything else, you can't be my disciple. That's what's required. Whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. If you ever forget that that's your priority, then you can no longer be my disciple. And he goes on in the next few verses to say, count the cost. Consider before you make that commitment because it is a once and for all commitment when we put our lives in God's hands. And so he says, don't get distracted. Don't lose sight of what that one big thing is. Take heed. Luke 21, turn another page or two, if you would please. Luke 21, verse 34. Luke chapter 21, verse 34. Another warning, an encouragement not to lose sight, not to lose focus on that one big thing. 
Jesus says here in Luke 21, 34, take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life. And that day come on you unexpectedly, for it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Because they're not going to be focused on that one big thing. They're going to be distracted by many things. They're going to have many different pursuits instead of that one big one. And so verse 36 says, Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Take heed. Be careful. Don't get distracted. How can we be hedgehogs about the kingdom of God? What can we do practically to help keep our focus on that one big thing? I'll make a few suggestions, or rather, I'll underline a few suggestions that the Bible gives to us. Matthew chapter 6. We'll start in Matthew chapter 6. Verse 10. Well, we'll start in verse 9 and read, verse, read through verse 10. In this manner, therefore, pray. Here's the model prayer that Jesus gave to his disciples. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And right at the beginning of the prayer, we're supposed to pray, your kingdom come. That's one thing we can do to stay focused on that one big thing, is to pray about it. It should be, according to the model prayer that Jesus gave us here, it should be a part of every prayer. When we have our personal prayer time with God, we're supposed to mention, let your kingdom come. And of course, we understand that this prayer is more like chapter headings. Each line here is a chapter heading, and we're supposed to fill it in and develop it more fully. So we pray about the need for God's kingdom to come. We ask God's inspiration on the work, which must preach the gospel to all nations before the end can come. There's lots to pray about under that one heading, your kingdom come. But that's supposed to be an integral part of every personal prayer that we have. When we do our daily prayer before God, that should be a part of it. Those prayers count. God hears those prayers. The book of Revelation talks about the prayers of the saints going up before God mixed with incense. It's like incense. And finally, when God decides it's a time to act, He decides that partially as a function of those prayers that have been going up from his people for 2,000 years plus. Those prayers count. God hears the prayers of his people. They matter. And so it should be. That should be an important element of our prayer daily. Thy kingdom come. The world needs your kingdom. Human beings need your kingdom. Please let it come as soon as possible. That's one thing we could do, one thing we should do. The Bible tells us, instructions by Jesus himself, pray this way, and that's part of it. Another thing we can do is meditate on the kingdom of God. I would submit to you it should be something we think about a lot. If it's the one big thing that gives meaning and focus to our lives, we should be thinking about it a lot. Psalm 77. Let's look at Psalm 77. Psalm of Asaph, collected by David and Solomon, put together in this collection. But one of the things that's mentioned, and David mentions it quite frequently in his psalms, is how he meditated on the work of God, the works of God, what God was accomplishing, his plan, what he was doing, what he'd already accomplished, and what he's promised yet to accomplish. Psalm 77, verse 10. I said, this is my anguish, but I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. And many of those years are to come. Most of them are yet to come. I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember your wonders of old. I will also meditate on all your work. And as we've been seeing, the central work that God is preparing for now, everything that he's been doing is leading up to the kingdom of God and the entry of human beings, changed, transformed human beings into that kingdom. I will meditate on all your works and talk of your deeds. Your way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? You are the God who does wonders. You've declared your strength among the peoples. You have with your arm redeemed your people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph. Selah. 
which means pause, think about it. Think about what you just read or what you just sang. Think about the words that preceded this. Meditate on the kingdom. And I think a very excellent way to do it um, is to spend time with the parables. Almost all of the parables have to do with the kingdom of God. They all illustrate different aspects of the kingdom or what we need to do to be able to inherit the kingdom and be a part of it. The pearl of great price, the sower and the different kinds of soil into which the seed falls, the honest and the dishonest servants, the unprofitable servant, the wedding supper. All of these various parables are fascinating stories with vital spiritual lessons for us about the kingdom of God. Each one of those merits meditation, thought, thinking about how they apply to us. What should I do differently as a result of understanding the lesson of this parable? How can this make a difference in the way I live my life? Because the kingdom is that one big thing. Matthew chapter 6, we already read it, verse 33, says to seek the kingdom first. That's got to be the thing that we seek before all other things. Now, it's not wrong to have secondary goals. We should have other goals as well in life. It's important. But none of them can even approach the importance of that one big thing. All other goals, all other hopes, dreams, plans, worries, concerns should all be seen in the light of that one big thing, the kingdom of God. Usually when we're troubled or dissatisfied or doubting or angry in life, and we probably all have periods like that, usually it's because we're not seeking first the kingdom of God. Other things are crowding in our lives and crowding out the kingdom of God. We're beginning to be distracted by other things and we're not wholeheartedly, single-mindedly pursuing the one big thing. So we've got to seek it first. And that's a challenge because there are a lot of distractions in the world. There really are. And so it's important for us to really concentrate on keeping our focus where it belongs. John chapter 8 also has an interesting suggestion for us about what we can do to stay focused on that one big thing. John chapter 8 Gospel of John, chapter 8, verse 56. Kind of an oblique reference to Abraham here. It says Abraham did something that I believe you and I should be doing as well. Jesus said, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it. And was glad. How did Abraham see Jesus' day? See his day means his work, the accomplishment of his mission. Uh, It's a definite reference to the kingdom of God. Abraham didn't literally see the kingdom of God, but he understood that it was coming. And perhaps in some of the conversations that he had, With God, he had that privilege on a number of occasions. Perhaps he was given some explanation about what it was going to be like. No doubt that was the case. And Abraham knew enough to see it. He visualized what it was going to be like. It says even he rejoiced to see it. It became so real to him. He was thinking about it so much and dwelling on it that it filled him with joy. He rejoiced. And Jesus said, he really did see my day. He saw what was going to happen, to whatever extent he was allowed to do so, and he was glad. I think that's something we can do as well. We can rejoice in the knowledge of the kingdom. It should fill us with joy. Did Abraham, when the light went on that first time and he was given that understanding of it, maybe similar to the first time you read a booklet explaining what the kingdom was, and the light went on, and you realized this is not what I thought it was. This is not what I was taught wherever I came from. This is new. Wow. The kingdom of God is really coming. It's going to be established here on the earth. It's sure and certain. How magnificent. But sometimes, because we've known about something for a long time, 
it can lose some of its luster, it can lose some of its immediacy, some of its impact. And that's something we can't let happen. We need to rejoice in it, really be filled with joy when we think about what it means, what it's going to mean for human beings, what it's going to mean for the future, the future of everyone who's lived. We don't have to be overwhelmed in distress in this life as long as we remain focused on one big thing. We don't have to worry about what we'll eat, what we'll drink. We don't have to be in distress about health problems or family trials or economic meltdown or government corruption or roar, wars and rumors of wars because all of that is passing away. One day all of that will be ancient history, never to exist again. Because what we'll know in the end, what will exist in the end, will be that one big thing. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, a passage we probably know well, most of us would know it close to memory. Paul said, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Why are we supposed to meditate on those things? Because these are the things of the kingdom of God. This is the way life is eventually going to be for everyone and forever. This is a description of the way of life of the king of kings. And it's the description of how we're learning to be. So that in the end, when the kingdom is finally established, we'll be able to teach those who are coming along in their understanding until finally everyone can be in the kingdom of God. 1 John chapter 2, last passage, 1 John 2, verse 15. We read this earlier, but we're going to go one verse farther now. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Don't get distracted. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. All the foxes are out chasing their tails and chasing all of these things that do not satisfy in the end. And then verse 17 adds something really important. And the world is passing away. All those prides we were reading about earlier, all those futilities that people pursue in life, that's passing away. One day that will all be gone. It will all be, as I said, ancient history. But he who does the will of God abides forever. When we do the will of God, we abide forever because that's what the kingdom of God will do. It will abide forever. The fox knows many things, but the hedgehog knows one big thing. The world knows many things, the things of the world. But as Christians, we are to know one big thing, the thing that gives sense, purpose, and meaning to our lives, a single, universal, organizing principle in terms of which alone all that we are and do has significance. The kingdom of God. 